All right, dear friends, Fagin Live is on air again. It's Saturday, 11 p.m. in Moscow and Kiev, and uh, our guest today is again Alexei Rostovich, a little later than normal. It's day 38 that we're discussing. Uh, yes, uh, I have to tell to our dear viewers, I'm spending a lot of time in the fields, and they're very unpredictable, so please, my apologies, we can move some dates or cancel on occasion, but uh, the first thing I'm trying to do when I get back is to record the Chronicle with Mark. I hope you understand, uh, dear viewers, that uh, conditions of war, they dictate certain schedules. All right, so we have about 80,000 people watching us live, and uh, we'll start with brief, if possible, analysis what happened during the last 24 hours. So the most important thing is that we cleaned Kiev region completely. The remnants of Russian troops are leaving towards Sumy. There is a little bit of Russian artillery left near Chernigov that is still hitting. The city, and uh, according to some data, we are losing about 200 civilians in that area, roughly about every day. And it's a bit difficult for our troops to clear that artillery because uh, what we see is that some of it is hitting Chernigov from beyond the border. In um, Sumy Oblast, uh, Russian troops had to send uh, some fuel to help evacuate their troops, but they parked in a very inopportune place and exploded. So we helped them a little bit. And uh, um, yes, uh, intrigue, intrigue on the east is finally revealing itself after three or four days that were standstill, they're starting to move. Not much improvement on the north. Some of those troops that are being withdrawn from the north, they're not coming back to attack the eastern front from the north. They're being brought to the east or to the south. We, we are using that condition to try to push back some. Again, Mariupol is a little different. It's smaller and it's fighting by itself. And heroically, they're pulling a lot of enemy troops onto that part. Mariupol is really helping us by dragging a lot of their troops onto itself. They destroyed approximately six high-level Russian military commanders near Mariupol, so they're very professional. And we finally managed to unseal it with the buses from our mainland. At least that's what I heard there. That's the intention, to try to get some uh, people out. Get the civilians out of that place. And uh, that seems like it's a result of a Turkish negotiation. And military people are staying there because they've chosen to do that and uh, they've chosen to do that duty. And uh, you do need to evacuate civilians. But military guys, they're literally providing a huge support to us just by the fact of staying alive and continuing to resist. Well, 
So, as a resume, Marek Mariupol is taking a lot of enemy forces, drawing a lot of enemy forces, and uh, is helping us to ensure the victory of Ukraine in as soon as possible manner. And we're trying to help them to evacuate civilians. So, what's happening in Kherson? They're all in the defensive mode in Kherson, and we're moving. It's not a great advancement on our side, but it's some movement around it to make their standing a little more difficult. So, can we expect a change of that situation in some good capacity? Uh, I understand that take back Kherson is uh, probably a goal that the Ukrainian army has. Oh, our goal is to take back the whole Ukraine, but um, I cannot say that Taking back her son is the thing that will happen in the next couple of days. All right, what else can we talk about today? Uh, I want to touch about the marauders. That uh, phenomenon became really prominent in the last few days, and we understand that during war many things happen, but the scale of these robberies and thievery of stores, banks, private people's houses, and using military equipment to evacuate the goods. Do you, what is your opinion on that? What is your take on this? Because from what we see, it's unusual proportions. Do you think it's uh, a command to do that, to, to, to behave like this? I cannot say this is their official order, but... I would uh, agree that it's a mass phenomenon with the Russian army. Commanders are there to prohibit things like that and to keep their troops in line because that behavior decays an army. So, ideally, the officer has to use high motivation or high discipline, probably a mix of both, to keep the army in line. But on one hand, murder is not a big deal if you kill your enemy and take something from him, but still it is a decay of an army. And uh, basically, the commander should not be a good commander, should not be letting people do that because they're becoming a little bit lawless and step by step. They may become uncontrollable, and next time when you tell them, stop, we're not taking the rings off these bodies, but we're going to attack and advance to the next place, next position, they'll pretty much go tell you, go fuck yourself. So, the army becomes, the such army becomes a really poor instrument, poor tool to use. And that's why a good commander would be trying to prevent that. Just from the practical reasons of keeping control over his troops. And I have to say that from what we saw, their retreat from north west of Kiev was very professional. They left some of the protective troops to cover them. They threw some landmines here and there. We even had some casualties because it was not easy to. Pursue, pursue them. But something happened later, something happened, and the mass just started running. Some troops were still holding positions and retreating properly, but the general amount of them were just fleeing. So something happened there. It was interesting. I can give an example. We have a village, Dmitryevka, in the north, uh, towards Bravary, northeast. So usually they're leaving more uh, fighting capable troops to protect the retreat. So there is a detachment there with 10 tanks. Our two tanks roll out on them and manage to destroy all 10 of their tanks and some of the uh, armored vehicles too. Could their troop fight back, fight off two tanks from Ukraine? There are only two reasons that uh, that would not happen. So, would be ammo 
but they were shooting back. So this is not really a uh, cause. They, they were trying to shoot back. They just missed. And the second part is morale. What I think happened also is when they were leaving, as they were progressing and leaving the territory, they were picking more stuff, more goods through the villages they were passing through, and they more and more become incapable of uh, orderly fighting. So they pretty much just drop their stuff, stop fighting, take laundry machines, take equipment, and just flee with goods they can grab. That's why very often during that retreat we found some of their tanks, and the tanks were left, just they wouldn't care. But we also, after destroying some of the vehicles, we saw the some of the laundry machines, some of the equipment uh, that they tried to steal. But we also found that they did take some gold items, and some of them actually had blood on the earrings, and that's pretty bad. And also they, take, they took hostages, and what's weird, what's really bad, they are concerning, they took children, underage children. They took young girls. I would not uh, speculate much about their status or what happened with them, but there were cases when we did record that they took young girls and kids as hostages. So here comes the question, whom are we dealing with? The kind of worse than fascist experience that Ukraine had during the Second World War. And I was out there today, I posted some pictures. There are some victims uh, shot in Bucha with their hands tied behind their backs, just execute, execution style. And the closer to get uh, on the outskirts of Bucha, uh, they were still kind of in a fighting, semi-fighting mode, they were leaving. But in Bucha, and as you get closer, they see more and more, we see more and more thievery. They're shooting more people, and they're shooting even dogs and house animals. Even Nazis during the Second World War did not do that. German army at least had ideology, and they had, it was a bad ideology, but they could fight, and they were following, and they had some honor, and they were fighting for some reason. This army has no ideology. This is just evil. An example from a friend of mine from Trostinets, a small town. They built recently a new train station, new park, and new hospital. They opened about three months before war or so. So what the locals are telling, that Russian tank, as they were leaving, turned its gun and just shot up the hospital. We do not have any explanation that these are just orcs. Not the whole Russia, but this detachments here that are fighting with us, they are orcs. Irpen, Bucha, Gostomel, they were very upscale towns, suburbs of Kiev. Very beautiful, more beautiful than many European places, nicer than nice. And so that army, leaving through that, it's almost every hundred yards, if not a yard, there is a military crime that we can record. And as they were taking more and more stolen items on board, not to uh, upset the descendants of Napoleon army, but it's a similar case when some of the Napoleon troops actually managed to sustain their fighting capability all the way through leaving Russia. But this is 21st century. This is basically a crime against civilization. Now a question. How did one of the biggest countries in the world, with Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and Tolstoy, literary figures, who is a member of the United Nations Security Council, how did they manage to bring up such a generation in 20 years? Is it all being recorded? Is any procedural side to that? At least crimes in Bucha? Yes, we do record that. Because I saw there are a lot of uh, male population, significant part of male population in Bucha is uh, executed. What are local people telling us? He looked at them differently, or if somebody looked at them differently, or talked back, or asked not to take their things, they would be shooting them.
And if you see somebody shot with his hands behind the back, that's procedural. So somebody was detained, arrested, detained, uh, interrogated, and then executed. So when we say that they're just coming to kill, I'm remembering as I was giving interviews before the war, I was saying that it was my opinion that they're bringing death, they're bringing concentration camp, that they'll kill first our defenders, then our political figures, and local people, and they will be killing. Uh, that is what Putin's world is or brings for Ukraine, because many people can, were under illusion that they will come and try to improve things, that that will be as a result speaking more Russian and listening to more Russian pop music. But uh, instead we have animals who come here and they tear out the earrings, shoot people up without any reason. What's worse, Mark, is that I think they do think and recognize what's happening, but they still push the trigger, squeeze the trigger and kill. It's about 200,000 people watching us live, and it's, you know, evening, late hour, but uh, people are watching us. Have you seen the picture of that paratrooper whom we, what we found in his pockets? We managed to kill him uh, during the retreat, but in his pockets we found a bunch of rings and earrings with, in blood, so torn out of ears of girls. And uh, we all managed to, to, somebody managed to take it out, lay it out in his uh, chest, right next to letters to his fiance that he was planning to bring these the gold stuff to. Uh, so message to Russian military, is there any way you can prevent your orcs from maraudering and doing that? to a civil population, because you, you're totally losing any image, any good image you may have had in somebody's eyes. I cannot even imagine, I cannot remember any decent step that I have heard about their army. I like collecting counterpoints for that historic diary. And I cannot find any single good thing reported to me about the Russian army. It's just darkness, destruction, and murder. Yeah, so we're about 17 minutes on live. Um, do we have time? Sure, yeah, we can talk more. Let's uh, turn to the other subject. So some press in Britain is starting to report that uh, things are changing and they persuade Western countries to deliver some heavy machinery, heavy equipment to help Ukrainians fight. Any changes on that side? <clears throat> I can say that for sure political stance changed. They changed politically. They're ready to support and to give some of that equipment. But it probably takes at least a week from the change of political position to the actual heavy armor on the battlefield. It's weeks. It's not one week, it's weeks. If it is a Russian equipment, yeah, it's probably a week. But uh, if it is a Western armor armament, uh, it takes time to learn it and to know how to use it. So it's good, yeah, please give it, but it will not change the flow of current campaign, I think. Uh, we, we still need it, but it might not be able to help us immediately. Right, weapons uh, will never go in vain, we, we do need that. You told me that if there'll be a, a chance for counterattack for Ukrainian troops and uh, push Russians back, we will really need it. Uh, not just really need it, it is an essential factor. We cannot advance without it. It's possible, but it becomes so much more difficult because, what, you'll be running in the bushes with grenade launchers to try to advance? 
So the whole advanced maneuver is really more complicated, more complex uh, thing, because in this case it will be us moving in the armed vehicles and Russians will be those people at the green, greenery with grenade launchers. So we'll change the roles and we don't want to be in the role they were in. We want to do it more proper. So you need more support. But you do need uh, tanks and armored vehicles and artillery. We do have some of that. And they will go somewhere. Our troops will advance. But oh, what we have, our resources, uh, are resources for tactical maneuvers, for tactical advances, not for big strategical push. In the north, we could do a partisan advancement because there are a lot of forests and we could use partisans to just go through the forests and push them out. But in the east, it's a little harder and if you want to make, create a real full-scale attack and push them out, one does need a heavy equipment. And, and also... To deblocate Mariupol, you do need some of that equipment too. Uh, people like bringing up Mariupol and I understand some uh, civilians have no idea how can that be done, but some military people just pushing buttons with that. And they're saying that, yeah, there is nothing to it, just get your people together and go deblockade the city. Yeah, there are stories about Ukraine that uh, sergeants like giving advice to the heads of the command. There is some goods to that, but for, for real, no. <laughs> that, uh, a proper maneuver takes more preparation. And to a degree, we could do some things. Yes, we could probably throw some people in there to help. But there is a brigade of uh, Marines, uh, four Chechen detachments, one tank regiment and uh, another detachment special forces and that's near Mariupol so what light infantry can uh, harass them enough to persuade them to leave the, sur the surrounded city so when you hear people saying yeah we should no pause we should go and kill Putin's orcs everywhere it means they have no clue about the technical side I always want to ask what are you going to use to do that what with have you organized at least one advancement one attack in your life uh, or even just a march this is not, uh, you, you cannot do much with uh, light infantry that just runs around the bushes and shoots uh, AKs. It has to be done systemically. You're wrong if you're just thinking, we'll throw our people into the grinder and Russians will run. It does take an understanding that if we start advancing in mass, we'll exchange places with Russians. We'll have columns that are really vulnerable. We'll have troops who don't know where their own troops are, where the enemy is, and they're trying to push into the enemy's defense lines that are well prepared to uh, defend their positions. So in this case, one loses illusions uh, quickly, but at a really bad cost. What we're looking at right now is that, and what's uh, getting people a little drunk on power, that the Russian army performed very unprofessionally and our army performed really well. But that was in that current disposition. All right, you can push Russians out of the places that they came uh, to from to starting 24th of February. But uh, let's say Donbass region, LNR, DNR, that they took, and they had eight years to fortify that. And Russia has a really easy shoulder of support there with airplanes and artillery, so it's, it become, quickly becomes really not easy to take back these regions. So I have to say that also local population 
may also push back. Yes and no, there are some fanatics on their side, but enthusiasts on their side, but we also do we know for sure that there is a good support for Ukrainians there. And uh, still, it's a very costly proposition. Are you willing to lose tens of thousands of people doing it? So for us, it's really a a good part would be to push Russians back to the border situation before the 24th of February. And after that, we can do the referendum to kind of address people in the country and see are they eager to lose 10,000 of our troops trying to retake, reclaim DNR and LNR. And maybe that can help Zelensky at his negotiations with uh, Russians. So yesterday we discussed before the break some perspectives for negotiations and that perspective is not a game. Uh, No, negotiations is not a game. It's a tool. He is using it for certain purposes to alleviate some of the sanction speed because, look, he's talking, he's trying to do peace talks. And the other thing is to give him a chance to maneuver while he is talking to us. And people are asking us, why are you giving him chance to do that? Why are you talking, negotiating with them? Because they're deceiving you. They're using the pause to move their troops around. And then you basically ask them back, uh, where is the pause? There is active warfare happening right now. And uh, we are pursuing them where they retreat, we are pushing back where they try to advance, and even in Belgorod there is some sorcery happening on the Russian border. So that's my question, where is the pause? Where do you, why do you think we have paused during negotiations? And they usually don't have anything to respond because, uh, oops, there, there haven't been any pause. But still, it's important not to let him take a breather. Yeah. What I think is that Putin for sure is playing some history internally. Because there is nothing he can do about the sanctions at this point. Irregardless of negotiations, uh, he is getting hit with sanctions pretty heavily. Is there any information that for some level of negotiations they may throw things on the table? I understand that Zelensky wants to speak only to Putin, not to any of his VPs. I would not know. I know that Putin does want to show up somewhere because he does need to win something. And if he doesn't get anything new and he will not get anything, that means that it will not be him at the negotiations. He needs to be only where the victory is, so he needs to be internally to broadcast the interruption or prevention of a coup or something. He cannot be a face of defeat. 240,000 people are watching us live. My request for everybody to please subscribe to Fagin Live and follow Alexei Arestovich to his channel. Please subscribe to both. What else? Share the links to this broadcast to your friends. Now about the sanctions. On our side, we see how it works. Ukrainian political leadership is uh, helping West allies to fine-tune the sanctions against Russia. As I see, some people are still managing to evade the sanctions. And even some of their ex-helpers uh, in Ukraine are still staying outside of any sanction. Well, sanctions is a complicated story. A, it is a collective decision that you need to persuade 
members of the union and each member may have their own opinion about people. So it is almost like a third front. It's a very difficult work. It's political work. It's political front. Very often you cannot reveal that battlefield during the war. There are a lot of things happening. But uh, perhaps one day after the war we can talk about it. Where is more difficult? Americans uh, or with Americans or Europeans? Very different. Some goals are achievable only with Americans, others only with Europeans. I would even say that Americans are probably slacking behind a bit. Not entirely slacking, they're just directed at little different things. Europe doesn't want to restructure the market, it just wants to punish Putin. Uh, Americans really do want to change the structure of the market, which uh, has a far long-going consequences for Putin regime. And the matter of synchronization of efforts of uh, Britain, European Union, United States. So, for example, Skabeva, Solovyov, there are EU sanctions and Britain sanctions and Simonian. But Solovyov is not in British sanctions and none of them is in American sanctions. That is not right. True. This is not right. They did take, however, his villa, frozen his asset. So, this is uh, probably part of a political situ- issue, because they cannot really take it away from him. They can freeze the asset, and then it goes into political discussion what to do about it. And there is a lot of fighting and a lot of uh, things to resolve in order to come to some reasonable solution. I have to note that in Russia, in uh, that group, there is a complete hysteria and they're going psychotic. For example, one guy, Shanin, what's his name? He got into under European sanctions. He had a house in Lithuania, about uh, 100 square meters, a pretty good apartment uh, in a good place. And uh, Lithuania is pretty straightforward with items like this. If they are sanctioned, they just took it away from him. People need to understand that Western politics it's a combination of two things. It's a Machiavellianism, a lot of cynicism in it. Another is a balance of power. And balance of power is not entirely like national interests, but of my party within the nation. And then, yeah, after that follows the bigger balance. And, and after that, all the internal political interests are being defended with all the cynical power of money they have. And some people have a wrong impression about the West, that it's uh, egalitarian effort fraternity, you know, political school of thought. At, uh, when it gets, when the rubber hits the road, very often it's a lot of hard politicking happening behind. People want to have emotional solutions to their problems. And in politics, emotional solutions uh, seldom ever happen. Somebody, yeah, if you have friends from Lithuania, Poland, Estonia, what did it cost them to join NATO? All the Baltic countries, if Lithuanians are cursing their, their NATO allies, you can tell that there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of currents. It's kind of under under the carpet secret war that one can write a lot of books about. But it takes a lot of effort and time to make these different parties agree between each other.
которые будут написаны тома, мемуары, сняты фильмы. Тяжелейшая работа, тяжелейшая. The thing is, Russian top doesn't give a shit about how their people live. And they only care if they're getting sanctioned personally about things. So that's where we have to target the sanctions. Uh, we have almost 250,000 people watching us, and we can perhaps push the rest for tomorrow and see if we can talk then. You know, yeah, sure, it's war, and if circumstances permit, let's, let's do it tomorrow. Since we did decide to write these war chronicles, I'm trying to not uh, skip the dates, but I did take a lot of other responsibilities on my shoulders, so if I cannot be here, I'm, it's very capricious work. Yeah, I'm trying to be here, but sometimes I just cannot, and it's a lot of field work too. So, so friends, please subscribe to Alexei Restovich channel, subscribe to this channel, share your links, and we're planning to meet tomorrow, the usual time, 9 p.m., Kiev and Moscow. What if we move it while the people are here? What if I move it to 11 p.m. instead of 9 p.m.? Can we do that? Because uh, I'll be more comfortable. There'll be more guarantee that I'll be back here in town, back in Kiev by that time. Because, look, there are still 240,000 people watching us. You know, let's, let's do it late. Same, same late hour. All right, agreed upon. Let's do it tomorrow, 11 p.m. Also, please do subscribe to this English translation channel. And if you can, support us so we can spread it uh, far and wide in the English-speaking world as well.